Who is better qualified to discuss the supernatural and the paranormal <laughs> than the abnormal Sam Vaknin, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology, not parapsychology, and a member of the faculty of SIAPS. Okay, today we're going to discuss the concept of supernatural. I'm going to ask a simple, abrasive, in-your-face question. People who believe in the supernatural, are they plain dumb? <laughs> or maybe there's something to it. I will try to be as balanced as I can. The words supernatural, paranormal, and parapsychology are prime examples of oxymorons. Nature, by its extended definition, is all-inclusive, all-pervasive. Nothing is outside the orbit of nature. Everything that is logically and physically possible is within the purview of nature. Everything is natural. Even buildings, even tanks, even space shuttles, they're natural because they have been created by an animal known as Homo sapiens, who is part of nature. If something exists and occurs, ipso facto it is normal. Or abnormal, but never paranormal, never beyond normal. <laughs> Psychology is the science, or the pseudoscience, never mind, of human cognition emotion and behavior. No human phenomenon evades its remit. By definition, psychology deals with everything, repeat, everything that is human. So let's get rid of these words, supernatural, paranormal, and so on. They are nonsensical. Let's discuss the phenomena themselves with an open mind. As if in belated recognition of this truism, PEER, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory, the ESP, Extrasensory Perception Research Outfit, at Princeton University, closed down in February 2007, was established in 1979, and it has very little to show for these decades. The arguments of the proponents of the esoteric so-called sciences, parapsychology included, boil down to the following. Number one, that the human mind can alter the course of events and affect objects, including other people's brains, voluntarily. Example, telekinesis or telepathy, or involuntarily. Example, poltergeist. Number two, that current science is limited, for instance, by its commitment to causation and logic, and therefore, it is structurally unable, science is structurally unable to discern, let alone explain the existence of certain phenomena, such as remote viewing and precognition. This implies that everything has natural causes and that we are in a perpetual state of receding ignorance in the throes of an asymptotic quest for the truth. Sooner or later, that which is now perplexing, extraordinary, miraculous, unexplained, proto-science would be incorporated into science and be fully accounted for. Argument number three, that science is dogmatically biased against and therefore delinquent in its investigation of certain phenomena, objects and occurrences such as voodoo, magic and UFOs, unidentified flying objects. These claims of parapsychology echo the schism that opened in the monotheistic religions and in early Buddhism between the profane and the sacred, the here and the beyond. Not surprisingly, many of the first spiritualists were ministers and other functionaries of Christian churches. Three historic developments contributed to the propagation and popularity of psychical research. Number one, the introduction into parapsychology of scientific methods of observation, experimentation, and analysis, for example, the use of statistics and probability in the studies conducted at the parapsychology laboratory of North Carolina's Duke University by the American psychologist Joseph Banks Ryan, and in the more recent remote viewing Gansfeld sensory deprivation experiments. 
in all these statistics we used. Number two, historical trend. The emergence of counterintuitive models of reality, especially in physics, quantum theory, incorporating such concepts as non-local action at a distance, Bell's theorem, emergentism, multiverses, hidden dimensions, observer effects, mind over matter, creation ex nihilo, tunneling and entanglement. These models are badly understood by laymen and have led to the ostensible merger of physics and mystics, mysticism. And finally, the last trend is the eventual acceptance by the scientific community and incorporation into the mainstream of science, mainstream of science, of phenomena that were once considered paranormal and then perinormal. So the, these certain behaviors or traits or events or qualities or objects were first considered paranormal, then they became perinormal, and then they became normal when they, were accept, when they were accepted by the scientific community and incorporated into the mainstream of science. One example is hypnotism. As many scholars noted, psi, psychic, and other anomalous phenomena and related experiments can rarely be reproduced in rigorous laboratory settings. But the same goes for experiments in sociology and psychology. So that is not proof that is, should not be held against parapsychology. Though at least 130 years old, or maybe 150 years old, depends, depending where you start, the field of parapsychology and the paranormal generated no theories replete with false, falsifiable predictions. Additionally, the deviation of finite sets of data, the number of cards correctly guessed by subjects, for example, these deviations from predictions yielded by the laws of probability, presented as the field's trump card, they are nothing out of the ordinary. Furthermore, statistical significance and correlation should not be misconstrued as proof of cause and effect. Consequently, there is no agreement as to what constitutes a psi event. Still, these are weak refutations. As I said, they apply with equal force to the social so-called sciences, economics even, let alone psychology, and even to more robust fields like biology or medicine. Yet no one disputes the existence of economic behavior or of the human psyche, so why dispute the existence of the paranormal? To answer this, we need to delve into the issue of what makes a scientific theory, what, or what makes a theory scientific. All theories, scientific or not, start with a problem. They aim to solve the problem by proving that what appears to be problematic is actually not. Theories restate the conundrum or introduce new data, new variables, a new classification or new organizing principles. They incorporate the problem in a larger body of, body of knowledge or in a conjecture, a solution. They explain why we thought that we had an issue on our hands and how it can be avoided, vitiated or resolved. Scientific theories invite constant criticism and revision. They're always wrong. They're always wrong, not right. They yield new problems. They are proven erroneous and are replaced by new models which offer better explanations and a more profound sense of understanding, often by solving these new problems. From time to time, the successor theories constitute a break with everything known and done till that time, and these seismic convulsions are known as paradigm shifts. Contrary to widespread opinion, even among scientists, science is not only about facts. It is not merely about quantifying measuring, describing, classifying and organizing things, entities. It is not even concerned with finding out the truth. Science is about providing us with concepts, explanations, a language, predictions, collectively known as theories, and thus endowing us with a sense of understanding of our world. Scientific theories are allegorical. 
They are metaphoric. They revolve around symbols and theoretical constructs, concepts, or in substantive assumptions, axioms, hypotheses, most of which can never, even in principle, be computed, observed, qualified, quantified, measured, or correlated with the world out there. By appealing to our imagination, scientific theories reveal what David Deutsch called the fabric of reality. Like any other system of knowledge, science has its fanatics, heretics, and deviants. Instrumentalists, for instance, insist that scientific theories should be concerned exclusively with predicting the outcomes of appropriately designed experiments. Their explanatory powers are of no consequence. Positivists ascribe meaning only to statements that deal with observables and observations. Instrumentalists and positivists ignore the fact that predictions are derived from models, narratives, and organizing principles. In short, it is the theory's explanatory dimensions, hermeneutic dimensions, that determine which experiments are relevant and which are not. Forecasts and experiments that are not embedded in an understanding of the world, in an explanation of the, of the universe, these kinds of forecasts and experiments do not constitute science. So theories define the experiments, give rise to the experiments, yield the experiments that are supposed to falsify them. Experiments cannot deviate from the theory or be unrelated to it, of course. Granted, predictions and experiments are crucial to the growth of scientific knowledge and the winnowing out of erroneous or inadequate theories. But they are not the only mechanisms of natural selection in science. There are other criteria that help us decide whether to adopt and place confidence in a scientific theory or not. Is the theory aesthetic, parsimonious, logical? Does it provide a reasonable explanation? And thus, does it further our understanding of the world? David Deutsch, in his, in his magisterial book, The Fabric of Reality, wrote, it is hard to give a precise definition of explanation or understanding. Roughly speaking, they are about why rather than what, about the inner workings of things, about how things really are, not just how they appear to be, about what must be so rather than what merely happens to be so, about laws of nature rather than rules of thumb, they are also about coherence, elegance, and simplicity, as opposed to arbitrariness and complexity. Reduction, reductionists and emergentists ignore the existence of a hierarchy of scientific theories and meta-languages. They believe, and it is an article of faith, not of science, that complex phenomena such as the human mind can be reduced to simple phenomena such as physics and chemistry of the brain. Furthermore, to this kind of scientists, the act of reduction is in itself an explanation and a form of pertinent understanding. Reduction is doing science. Human thought, fantasy, imagination, and emotions are nothing but electric currents and the spurts of chemicals in the brain, they say. Holists, on the other hand, refuse to consider the possibility that some higher level phenomena can indeed be fully reduced to base components and primitive interactions. They ignore the fact that reductionism sometimes does provide explanations and understanding. The properties of water, for example, do spring forth from its chemical and physical composition and from the interaction between its constituent atoms and subatomic particles. Still, there is a general agreement that scientific theories must be abstract, independent of specific time or specific place. They must uh, intersubjectively uh, express things. They must be intersubjectively explicit. They must contain detailed descriptions of the subject matter in unambiguous terms. They must be logically rigorous, make use of logical systems shared and accepted by the practitioners of the field or in the field. They must be empirically relevant. They must correspond to results of empirical research. They must be useful in describing and or explaining the world. And finally, they must provide typologies 
predictions intended to falsify the theory. A scientific theory should resort to primitive atomic terminology, and all its complex derived terms and concepts should be defined in these indivisible terms. It should offer a map unequivocally and consistently connecting operational definitions to theoretical concepts. Operational definitions that connect to the same theoretical concepts should not contradict each other, should not be negatively correlated. They should yield agreement on measurement conducted independently by trained experimenters. But investigation of the theory of its implication can proceed even without quantification. We do have and should have qualitative theories. Theoretical concepts need not necessarily be measurable or quantifiable or even observable. But a scientific theory should afford at least four levels of quantification of its operational and theoretical definitions of concepts. Nominal, labeling, ordinal, ranking, interval, and ratio. As we said, scientific theories are not confined to quantified definitions or to a classificatory apparatus. To qualify as scientific, theories must contain statements about relationships, mostly causal relationships, between concepts, empirically supported laws and or propositions, statements derived from axioms. Philosophers like Karl Hempel and Ernst Nagel regard a theory as scientific if it, if it is hypothetical deductive. To these scholars, scientific theories are sets of interrelated laws. We know that they are interrelated because a minimum number of axioms and hypotheses yield in an inexorable deductive sequence everything else known in the field the theory pertains to. Explanation is about retrodiction, using the laws to show how things have happened. Prediction is using the laws to show how things will happen. Understanding is explanation and prediction combined. William Whewell augmented this somewhat simplistic point of view with his principle of consilience of inductions. Often, he observed, inductive explanations of disparate phenomena are unexpectedly traced back to one underlying cause. This is what scientific theorizing is about, finding the common source, the common cause of the apparently separate. And this omnipotent view of the scientific endeavor competes with a more modest semantic school of philosophy of science. Many theories, especially ones with breadth, width, and profundity, such as Darwin's theory of evolution, many theories are not deductively integrated and are very difficult to test, to falsify conclusively. The predictions are either scant or very ambiguous. Scientific theories, goes the semantic view, are amalgams of models of reality. These are empirically meaningful, only in as much as they are empirically, directly, and therefore semantically applicable to a limited area. A typical scientific theory is not constructed with explanatory and predictive aims in mind. Quite the opposite, I would say. The choice of models incorporated in a scientific theory dictates its ultimate success in explaining the universe and predicting the outcomes of experiments. So back to parapsychology. Is parapsychology a science by these definitions? Is it a scientific theory or is it anti-science? Science deals with generalization, the generation of universal statements known as laws. And these generalizations are based on singular existential statements founded in turn on observations. Every scientific law is open to falsification. Even one observation that contravenes it is sufficient to render the law invalid, a process known in formal logic as modus tollens. In contrast, parapsychology deals exclusively with anomalous phenomena, observations that invalidate and falsify scientific laws. By definition, these don't lend themselves to the process of generation of testable hypotheses. One cannot come up with a scientific theory of exceptions only. Parapsychological phenomena, once convincingly demonstrated in laboratory settings, 
can help to upset current scientific laws and theories. They cannot, however, yield either a scientific law or a scientific theory because they cannot be generalized and they do not need to be falsified. They are already falsified by the prevailing paradigms, laws and theories of science. And these shortcomings of parapsychology render deficient and superfluous the only construct that comes close to a parapsychological hypothesis, the psi assumption. Cross the fence, pseudo-skeptics are trying to prove, to produce evidence, that psi phenomena do not exist. But while it is trivial to demonstrate that something or event exists or existed, it is impossible to show that something or event does not exist or has never existed. <laughs> the skeptic's anti-parapsychology agenda is therefore fraught with many of the difficulties that bedevil the work of psychic researchers. It's a, flip, it's a flip side of the same coin. And there's also a problem with human subjects, a problem common to psychology as well. Can parapsychology generate a scientific theory, either prescriptive or descriptive? Let us examine closely the mental phenomena collectively known as ESP, extrasensory perception, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, retrocognition, remote viewing, psychometry, xeno xenoglossy, uh, mediumism, channeling, clairaudience, clairsentience, and possession, and so on and so forth. Let's examine this phenomena. The study of these alleged phenomena is not an exact science, nor can it ever be. This is because the raw material, human beings and their behavior as individuals and en masse, the raw material is fuzzy and mutable, changes all the time. Such a discipline will never yield natural laws or universal constants, for example, like in physics. Experimentation in the field is constrained by legal and ethical rules. Human subjects tend to be opinionated, develop resistance and become self-conscious when they are observed. Even ESP proponents admit that results depend, crucially, on the, victi on the subject's <laughs> mental state and on the significance attributed by him or her to events and people that he is communicating with. These core issues cannot be solved by designing less flawed, better controlled and more rigorous experiments, or by using more powerful statistical evaluation techniques. This is not going to change the raw material or the problems with the raw material. To qualify as meaningful and instrumental, any parapsychological explanation or theory must, follow this, must fulfill the following conditions. It must be all inclusive, anamnetic, it must encompass, integrate, and incorporate all the facts known. It must be coherent. It must be chronological, structured, and causal. It must be consistent. It must be self-consistent. Its subunits cannot contradict one another or go against the grain of the main explication. And it must be consistent with the observed phenomena, both those related to the event or subject and those pertaining to the rest of the universe. It must be logically compatible. It must not violate the laws of logic, both internally and externally. Internally, the explanation must abide by some internally imposed logic. And externally, it must abide by the Aristotelian logic, which is applicable to the observable world. It must be insightful. It must inspire a sense of awe and astonishment, which is the result of seeing something familiar in a new light or the result of seeing a pattern emerging out of a big body of data. The insights must constitute the inevitable conclusion of the logic, the language, and of the unfolding of the explanation. It must be aesthetic. The explanation must be both plausible and right, beautiful, not cumbersome, not awkward, not discontinuous, smooth, parsimonious, simple, Occam's razor, and so on which leads to parsimony, parsimony. Any theory must be parsimonious. The explanations must employ the minimum number of assumptions and entities in order to satisfy all the above conditions. The theory must, of course, be explanatory. The explanation must elucidate the behavior of other elements, including the subject's decisions and behaviors, and why events developed the way they did. It must be predictive. 
prognostic. The theory or explanation must possess the ability to predict future events, including the future behavior of the subjects. And finally, it must be elastic. The explanation must possess the intrinsic abilities of, to self-organize, reorganize, give room to emerging order, accommodate new data comfortably, and react flexibly to attacks from within and from without. And in all these respects, parapsychological explanations can qualify as scientific theories. They satisfy most of the above conditions. So you could say, well, that's what I'm saying. Parapsychology is a science. It's a scientific theory. But, but that's very misleading. Because scientific theories must also be testable, verifiable, and refutable, falsifiable. The experiments that test the predictions of scientific theories must be repeatable and replicable in tightly controlled laboratory settings and randomized trials. All these elements are largely missing from parapsychological so-called theories and explanations, and admittedly from psychological so-called theories and explanations. No experiments can be designed to test the statements within such theories and explanations, to establish their truth value and thus to convert them to theorems or hypotheses in a theory. There are four reasons to account for this inability to test, improve, or falsify parapsychological theories. Problem number one, ethical. To achieve results, subjects have to be ignorant of the reasons for experiments and the aims of the experiments. Sometimes even the very fact that an experiment is taking place has to remain a secret. This is known as double-blind double experiments. Some experiments may involve unpleasant or even traumatic experiences, and this is ethically unacceptable. Problem number two, the psychological uncertainty principle. The initial state of a human subject in an experiment is usually fully established, but the very act of experimentation, the very processes of measurement and observation, invariably influence and affect the participants and render this knowledge irrelevant. The subject matter has changed. Number three, uniqueness. Parapsychological experiments are therefore bound to be unique, non-replicable. They cannot be repeated or replicated elsewhere and at other times, even when they are conducted with the same subjects who are no longer the same owing to the effects of their participation in the study. This is due to the aforementioned psychological uncertainty principle. Repeating the experiments with other subjects adversely affects the scientific value of the results because they are other subjects. <laughs> Finally, there's a problem with the undergeneration of testable hypotheses. Parapsychology does not generate a sufficient number of hypotheses, which can be subjected to scientific rigorous scientific testing. This has to do with its fabulous storytelling nature. In a way, parapsychology has affinity with some private languages or literary art forms. It's literature, it's a form of art, and as such, it is self-sufficient and self-contained. If structural, internal constraints are met, a statement is deemed true within the parapsychology can canon, even if it does not satisfy external scientific requirements. So no, psychology and parapsychology can never ever be sciences and can never yield scientific theories.